Good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman. I'm talking from Seattle. Today is August 28th, 2020. And uh, I don't even know what day it is in the COVID uh, period. Uh, who, who keeps count? It's a beautiful morning here in Seattle, and I hope all of you feel uh, positive and invigorated. I thank you for your interest in our journal club, and it's an honor to present today. We have a mostly new group of fellows who are gonna talk about something that has become a focal point of interest uh, increasingly in spine surgery, and we've selected a couple of topics on this. It uh, revolves around the topic of prehab and spine surgery. As we all know, the spinal column is an amazingly complex uh, organic structure. I personally also think it should be an organ. 23 discs on average, there are sometimes more, sometimes less due to a variety of conditions. 53 joints are a setup for failure. But beyond that, we now realize that there's so much more to the organ system called uh, um, surrounding this spinal organ um, that really complicate lives. And we've had some terrific recent um, presentations on value in spine surgery. And again, the value equation of benefits versus costs is a really important one that we all have to uh, really uh, integrate into our general understanding, but also teaching efforts. And so this morning, topic is going to revolve directly on that and it's going to try to get back to the basis of some of these presumptions. Uh, the great uh, Joseph Cheng has identified that complications are very common in spine surgery. We now think that somewhere, and that depends upon where you put the threshold, one in ten to one in two patients have some pretty significant complications. And the costs of those are still not actually really accounted, um, but the average has been calculated by him to be around $48,000, and the chances that these go much higher, these figures, is very high. The concept of prehab, as far as I know, and here I'm a little bit biased in Seattle, was actually probably started by my former partner, David Hanscom, who is the uh, chairman of the non-surgical committee of the North American Spine Society. And that was defined as an effort to optimize patients' mental and physical well-being as a major part of elective spine surgeries to try to optimize uh, outcomes. And the prehab component was uh, based on being patient-focused, research-based, education-mediated, health status-related, activation as a goal, equaling better outcomes, meaning better value for our efforts. Now, as we have gone through complications, uh, there are a couple of insights. One is that complications are probably underreported in general. And that has a number of um, causes, and most of them are actually probably not intentional on the part of physicians, but are systems imminent. Um, so that's one very big thing, and complications are part of our treatment. Now, as we delved deeper into complications, it's very clear that there are actually mainly two categories. Uh, one is preventable complications, and the other one are factual complications. Today's journal club is going to revolve around four examples. We didn't want to overload everybody with five uh, subtopics. But the five domains in this prehab process were revolving around detoxification, metabolic optimization, weight loss, cardiovascular optimization, and psychosocial circumstances. And Dr. Gayumi, our administrative chief, is going to take the first stab in talking about detoxification. Detox, just to quickly go over these five domains, is nicotine, alcohol, and opiates. Some of them are no-brainers, but he selected uh, one of those topics to basically delve into a little bit deeper. Metabolic optimization, glucose-controlled bone health are some of the other no-brainers, but maybe not so um, uh, clear. Weight loss is a really big deal. So our joint colleagues have pretty much now through the bank adopted the BMI of 35 or less as being a threshold for elective total joint surgeries. Is this something that we should, uh, for elective cases at least, uh, adopt in spine surgery? Cardiovascular optimization, uh, the insight that you can actually optimize patients' health with some well-performed, low-impact uh, cardiopulmonary exercises is a really big deal. The kinesiophobia of patients is very widespread. The uh, uh, alert signaling that we should not move because something hurts is very widespread and, in fact, very adverse towards uh, optimal outcomes. 
And psychosocial circumstances are a really big deal. We obviously have significant problems with stable homes or lack thereof and uh, impairments of mental health. So those are some of the main things. I'm going to ask our administrative chief uh, fellow, um, Puria, uh, to come up here, introduce himself briefly, like all the fellows, and talk about his uh, general topic. So I'm going to just plug out here. I'm going to don my mask for transition and look forward to your thoughts. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Puria Gayomi. I'm one of the fellows here at Swedish Neuroscience Institute. Uh, my background is uh, I did my residency at USC in orthopedics, and I'm uh, very excited to be here. Uh, so the topic that I'm talking about is preoperative uh, biopsychosocial opioid reduction program in chronic patients undergoing spine surgery. And to get into that, we uh, I have a case to present before that. Uh, our patient is a 67-year-old female with multiple comorbidities, including diabetes, peripheral neuropathy, chronic pain, uh, that was hospitalized on the 1st of Jul uh, June of this year for acute mental status change, uh, low back pain, and uh, an acute inability to ambulate and bilat severe bilateral thigh pain. Uh, she was treated, uh, the, her mental status change was secondary to polypharmacy and it was treated appropriately. Uh, just a relevant history on her, she uh, baseline ambulates using a walker. Uh, she's an active smoker. She is on multiple pain medications, including 300 milligrams of MS cotton daily for her pain control. Uh, her diabetes is moderately controlled uh, and she denies any trauma, falls, or injuries. Um, images were obtained at the time. As you can see, she has evidence of degenerative scoliosis with uh, stenosis at multiple, severe stenosis at multiple levels, uh, worse at L3-4 and L4-5. Uh, at the time, uh, she was discharged and given a follow-up with a spine surgeon in the community uh, that after discussion with her, she was basically deemed being very high risk uh, for spine surgery and uh, therefore was just uh, recommended to pursue pain management and was discharged. Uh, she returned back to the emergency room uh, on the 28th of July, basically in sepsis with a grade four sacral D-cube and continued inability to ambulate. Uh, she was transferred to our facility at that point. We obtained a CT scan which shows clear evidence of instability. As you can see, there's air in the disc at L3-4, and her x-rays are pretty much unchanged from that last time. On her examination, she had weakness in her bilateral extremities and uh, no reflexes bilaterally. Uh, she was hospitalized. She was admitted. She underwent an extensive uh, infectious workup by the primary team that were worried that uh, the sepsis could be related to her back. Um, she underwent uh, aspiration of the disc, which ended up being negative. Uh, she failed a, an attempt for mobilization and bracing given her body habitus and her sacral D-cube. Lengthy discussion with multiple teams, including palliative care, uh, her primary internal medicine team, uh, infectious disease, uh, plastic surgery, and our team. Uh, she basically decided uh, to proceed with surgery. Um, she underwent a pretty uh, impressive optimization, both nutritionally and medically, and ended up undergoing her surgery, which uh, was a T8 down to pelvis uh, with an inner body at L2-3 and decompression. She did very well. She was ambulating uh, postoperatively and was just discharged recently from the hospital. Uh, and she also underwent uh, irrigation and debridement of her D-cube uh, by the plastic surgery team. Now this uh, basically just as it relates to the topic that we're talking about is a very complex patient with multiple comorbidities. She came in pretty deconditioned and malnourished. Uh, we basically had a multidisciplinary approach to her pre-op uh, optimization. She was detoxed from her uh, opiates uh, prior to her surgery um, and uh, was discharged uh, and was walking with PT postoperatively. Uh, now, the topic that I'm presenting, uh, the title of the, uh, the paper is a preoperative interdisciplinary biopsychosocial opiate reduction program in patients on chronic opioid analgesia prior to spine surgery. Um, and it was a case series that was uh, published out of Cedar sinai and uh, it was actually done by internal medicine and psychiatry, uh, and spine surgery was not involved. Uh, the background, uh, it's uh, the, obviously there's a, opioid uh, prescriptions in the U.S. is a hot topic. The estimated about five to eight million people's, uh, people are on opioid prescriptions for chronic pain. Uh, it's been shown that in spine surgery, uh, long-term associated with poor outcomes, including, uh, including decrease in quality of life, uh, increase in disability. Uh, there's been a change of uh, focus uh, to a multidisciplinary and multimodal approach to chronic pain management. Uh, and the goal of this uh, paper was to basically review outcomes of five surgical uh, spine patients who completed their interdisciplinary pain management program. 
their methods, uh, as I mentioned, this was a multidisciplinary preoperative assessment, uh, internist, uh, psychiatrist, and psychologist uh, with a focus on pain, physical therapy, and occupational therapy were all involved in preoperative assessment of the patients, and they came up with a tailored treatment plan uh, for each patient uh, to taper their opioid dose, and their uh, goal was to taper 10% per week. Uh, they treated the comorbid psychiatric disorders were using psychotropic medications, uh, and they used pain-focused cognitive behavior ther therapy uh, uh, in these five patients uh, preoperatively, and they followed them for about a month. Their outcome measure was using uh, PROMISE, which is a uh, validated patient-reported outcome measure, uh, and I put the list on that side. Uh, the results, they actually, in the paper, they go through and um, break down each patient, the five patients one by one. They go through their comorbidities and what medications they're on, but for the sake of time, uh, I'm not going to go through that. I included the, the averages, uh, the table that includes all the averages, as you can see, uh, for pain, uh, intensity, uh, interference, depression, anxiety, and sleep disturbances. They had uh, pretty significant decreases uh, uh, in the averages, but the most impressive was the decrease in um, uh, MED, which is morphine equivalent uh, dose uh, uh, for all patients, uh, and the satisfaction with social roles and physical fun functioning uh, improved in all five of the patients, on average in all, all five of the patients. In terms of the discussion, they did have uh, success with, using, uh, with reducing the opiate consumption uh, using their interdisciplinary approach. Uh, they had improvement in physical and uh, psychological function of these patients. Uh, they also had improved in sleep disturbance, uh, the disturbances and social function functioning of these patients. Obviously, in terms of weakness, it's a, a small case series study. There's really no statistical analysis, given how small their numbers are. Uh, there's really no assessment of importance of each of the components that they use uh, to, make, to find out uh, what part works better than the others. Short-term follow-up, they only had about a month follow-up postoperatively for these patients. And the patients that they including out of five of them uh, was a very heterogeneous group of patients. They had patients that only had one or two level Lammies, uh, mixed with patients who had uh, T10 to pelvis for deformities. Obviously, those are very different patients uh, in terms of their uh, pain uh, medication requirements. Uh, in conclusion, uh, this is an important study despite the obvious um, and major flaws. Uh, and as it relates to our patients, uh, our patient basically was denied spine surgery because of a chronic uh, and uh, a chronic pain and high dose pain management. Uh, without any further solutions to that, uh, using an approach like this, I think, can be very beneficial, especially to this patient population. As uh, Dr. Chapman kind of alluded, uh, I think the joint surgeon have, uh, uh, in my field, uh, they've really to some extent figure this out. Uh, in my institute, they had uh, preoperative classes. They had multidisciplinary and multi, true multimodal approach to pain management in these patients. Uh, and I know this been, uh, has been looked at in spine surgery as well. Uh, but a true multidisciplinary uh, approach was uh, something that I think was uh, kind of unique to the study. Uh, I think it can be done uh, in a bigger setting, uh, especially with a comparison gr group using a traditional approach. And I think it would be a very valuable study. So thank, thank you. you for uh, presenting this case and your data. Uh, in your survey of the literature, is there a strong evidence base uh, in favor of opiate reduction and elective spine surgeries preoperatively? Uh, and for spine, I can't think of any specific study that I could see, but uh, I do believe in other fields of orthopedics, there's definitely been shown that there's a, a strong benefit in reducing and uh, detoxing patients preoperatively uh, with benefits and uh, better outcomes postoperatively. You showed some of the data, but can you just uh, reiterate one of the hallmarks of that paper? How long was this preoperative conditioning program, and what's your gestalt on the cost? I know you don't have any cost data, right. but just by extrapolation, was this a very cost-intensive program? So time investment and monetary investment. They actually mentioned that they tailored it for each patient, but for one of to two other patients, this was six or seven pr uh, weeks preoperatively, and they would meet with them once or twice. Uh, so it sounds like it's an extensive program. Six weeks pre-op is a long time, and it would be costly to include all these different uh, groups of uh, people, therapy, uh, psych uh, psychiatry, psychology, internists. Um, so it could be costly, but in the long run, if we can get these patients off the medications and decrease their opioid uh, consumption, I think in the long run this could be beneficial. I do think doing a cost analysis using an approach like this would be very beneficial to get an idea. Um, in long term. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Heise, can you unmute your phone or your voice? Michael? 
Uh, I can't hear you on the public address system. Uh, Lee, can you see if Dr. Heise can be made audible? We can, we can hear him. Great. I can, you can't hear me? Yes, so you gave an absolutely outstanding uh, presentation <coughs> together with John Burleson uh, last Tuesday on ethics and spine surgery. Um, uh, and I hope all of the people on this uh, uh, session this morning will look at the uh, taped, uh, that's an old statement, uh, an anachronistic one, uh, uh, review. One thing that really troubles me is this patient that uh, Poria uh, showed was maxed out on opiates. She was completely somnal and she had developed horrible secondary issues. And here we're kind of forced into, after another prolonged hospitalization, uh, hospitalization, into doing kind of a desperado surgery with everybody watching us, the quote, evil spine surgeons. But she actually did great with surgery. We did not have a chance to detox her from her opiates. Tell us about denial of care um, for patients who have clearly unstable or neurologic crises uh, in the setting of a very complex, challenging uh, medical conundrum. Yeah, this this is something that does come. You're breaking up. Your heart. Slow. Oh, am I breaking up? Yeah, now you're good. Yeah, my, my okay. Uh, I've had one patient who had a horrible heart, and the cardio cardiothoracic team said her heart wasn't fixable, and she would not survive the surgery. And she had a back very much like the back you presented, although hers was actively infected. And there wasn't really a good thing to do for her from our standpoint, other than palliative care. I don't, I don't know that there is a, a perfect solution for cases like these. Uh, they're very challenging. I think you, you, we do the best we can to try and optimize the patient and give them the best result we can. I, I w in a case like yours, I think uh, I would have done what you did, which is the, the surgery to, to correct the issue. I think it was fairly clear, identifiable pain generator that you addressed, and I think you did a great job with it. I don't know that there's a a rule I can apply to all patients. Though. Would you be in yeah. Sorry, yeah, somebody, Scott, is that Scott? Yeah, I was going to ask a, or bring up a point for discussion that um, obviously there are two types of patients that we treat, patients that have, you know, neurologic issues and then patients that we treat just for pain. And, and, and you know, I think from a preoperative medication reduction standpoint, they fall into two different groups. I was wondering if, you had any guidelines from Seattle? I, I suspect we don't even have any agreement at TBI. I, I try to have the patients I treat just for pain at least try to get 50% opioid reduction. And we work with, with, with Andy Block and our pre-op psych uh, team to get that just, to, just so that they're on board and they're willing to participate in their care. Different group of patients, just pain alone versus a deteriorating neurologic status. So um, great point. There are very classic, clear indications for spine surgery, true instability slash major deformity and neurologic compromise. And beyond that, again, the question is how much optimization do we do? So um, in this patient, uh, this was, again, a very difficult um, kind of decision-making process because the way she was portrayed by our internists who meant well, uh, this was a prohibitive um, uh, contraindication to any surgery. And I think Michael portrayed a case very similar to that. Um, uh, we, we do have a, 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 a weekly uh, conference um, uh, with multidisciplinary input, but again, that's heavily led um, by a couple of key opinion leaders. So we still don't have a modality to kind of arrive at a consensus of practitioners, I think. And uh, if we stick to our guns of treating true instability, major deformity that is crippling and neurologic compromise, uh, we will usually fare pretty well, but um, even there, we're looked at very carefully by society and our um, uh, partners from other specialties as to complications. So this is truly still a gray zone. May, may I suggest that we proceed? So uh, the next speaker is Sven Fierler, and he's one of our wonderful research fellows, and he's a trauma surgeon. Actually, I'm going to ask him to introduce himself in a second. But another big topic has been avoidance of blood transfusions and surgery. I don't know how that, that is in other centers, uh, but uh, dropping uh, blood transfusions has been kind of a mantra almost and has led to one of those interdisciplinary collisions. Sven, without much further ado, take us into the realm of blood transfusions. Do they add complications to patients? 
Thanks very much, Dr. Chapman, for the introduction. My name is Sven Freela. I'm one of the research fellows here at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. I'm originally from Germany, um, where I'm a resident at the University Hospital Bergmannsheil in Bochum. Um, today I'm presenting a paper about the association between... Hold on a second, I just have to take something down. One, one second. Yep, we, we have to wait for a second due to technical problems. So Sven, uh, before you get started, I, assuming that you're live, um, is this avoidance of blood transfusion something that is a big topic in Bochum, also at your university hospital, which is, I gather, the largest trauma hospital in the world? Definitely. Um, so, like you mentioned, it is, it is, for example, a big point in atroplasty, uh, where we try to prepare our um, patients um, in front of the surgery so we can avoid um, blood transfusion if it's not necessary. And of course, it's the same for big um, surgeries, for example, in the pelvic region, um, where we want to be well prepared before starting our operation. And what is that based on? What is the main fear? I know I don't want to take your talk away, but there seems to be some technical problem in the back. So what is the fear about blood transfusion? Is it just cost saving or is there um, uh, the famous immunologic uh, adverse interaction fear? What's the problem? So um, still, of course, blood fusions are very, very safe, um, and especially in our regions. Um, but of course, you have to recognize that there are still some um, can still occur some problems. And one of the main problems we will talk about is infections, but on the other side, um, every patient can have immune deficiency uh, and so um, problems after operation which are avoidable. I think we are good now. Are we okay? All right. So, okay. Um, my paper I'm presenting today is the association between perioperative allogenic um, transfusion volume and postoperative infections in patients following lumbar spine surgery. Um, we will start with a very brief case presentation of a 69 years old female who underwent a T9 to pelvis um, spinal fusion. Um, indication was a severe walking difficulties and um, the patient couldn't stand straight anymore. Um, she had a previous L4, um, L5 decompression, um, but sadly the surgery had failed to provide her with any lasting relief. So during surgery, a cell saver was used, and the estimated blood loss was 1.5 liter. The preoperative um, pre hemoglobin was 12.9 gram per deciliter, and it decreased and decreased during the first um, post-operative days. Due to the stable vital signs and uh, normal exam, um, she didn't receive any blood transfusions in our hospital, um, even when her hemoglobin level was below eight at the third post-operative day. Today she's doing well, she had no infection and her gait is Im has improved. So after this uh, little warm up for our article, uh, which was published in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, um, back in 2013, uh, the authors concluded that perioperative transfusion is a risk factor for surgical site infections after reviewing uh, the recent literature. Um, but they found a lack of data regarding the volume of transfusion. So therefore, the purpose of the study was to determine um, if the volume of perioperative red blood cell transfusion influences the risk of surgical side infections following lumbar spine procedures. Of course, this topic is of particular interest for surgeons since infections impart an increased risk of post-operative um, patient morbidity and mortality and lead uh, to a loss of instrument, uh, instrumentation fixation, pseudotrosis, osteomyelitis, chronic pain, sepsis, and as well as a death. Taken together with a longer post-operative hospital, uh, hospitalization, a higher risk to be managed in ICU, as well as having a higher rate, uh, readmission rate, this is a catastrophic event for every um, affected patient. And in addition, the economic importance cannot be overstated. Um, for better understanding prevention and management of surgical site infect, uh, infect, uh, infections, several studies have been published and addressed a multitude of patient-specific factors as well as peri- and intraoperative risk factors. Okay. Um, frequently mentioned um, patient-specific risk factors, uh, for example, shown in this graphic, are age, smoking, alcohol, diabetes, corticosteroids, BMI. On the other hand, intraoperative or perioperative risk factors um, are the approach, the procedure, transfusion, revision, and length of surgery. 
Anyhow, the rationale for aggressive perioperative red blood cell transfusion following spine surgery has been established, but is still a point of contention in the literature and among surgeons. And like mentioned in the introduction, a detailed analysis of the transfuse volume was missing. Okay, let's move to the methods. Um, all surgical procedures performed at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center between 2005 and 2009 um, by one senior physician trained uh, spine surgeon and were retrospectively reviewed. They included laminectomy, instrumented and non-instrumented fusion, and anterior and posterior interbody fusion. Interoperative uh, autotransfusion was used in patients in all patients and subfascial postoperative savage um, systems were placed. Um, infections were counted to surgical, spine, uh, side, uh, surgical side infections within uh, 30 days after surgery like recommended by the CDC. CDC. The volume of blood cell transfusion for each procedure was obtained from the central data bank system. All patients who underwent transfusion received blood intraoperatively or in the immediate postoperative period um, defined as within 24 hours after surgery. Factors that influ influenced transfusion included large volume of blood loss, hypotension, and oliguria. Uh, the analysis um, was performed as a match case control study, which means um, one to five control subjects were matched to each um, case subject, subject by age, sex, BMI, smoking or diabetes status, Charles and comorbidity index, length of surgery, revision, iliac crest, bone graft, and allograft. These variables were chosen to eliminate them as potential confounders. The, the, uh, the impact of volume of transfusion was examined um, by, conditional, um, by conditional logistic regression, which is the gold standard for evaluation of one to X matches case control studies. Um, confounding of non-match variables were assessed by the impact of the potential confounder on the parameter estimated for the main effect. So in our paper, for example, that's the volume of transfusion. Um, and so if a removal of possible confounding variable caused a change of 10% or more, that variable was considered as being a real confounder. The results were summarized by odds ratio with a 95 um, confidence interval and the alpha level of an, um, 0 0.05. Um, to the results, a total of 1,799 procedures had an infection rate of 3.1%, um, which are 56 infection cases compared to 91 uh, match controls. The average age was uh, 61 years. This was consistent across the infection and control group. Regarding the procedures, laminectomy with instrumented fusion was the most frequently performed, um, was the most frequently performed, accounting for 87.5% um, of the infection case and 89% of the controlled case, with an um, p-value of 0 0.991. There was no significant difference in the matched variables, while the p-value ranged from 0 0.1 to 0 0.89. But there was a significant difference in the preoperative hemoglobin level um, and volume of interoperative uh, blood loss between the cases and the controls. Overall, there was no significant difference in the number of patients who received transfusion between the, um, between the infection and control um, group. Um, but, however, the patients who underwent transfusion and developed um, surgical side infection received nearly one and a half more units of blood than um, did the matched controls. The volume of transfusion was significantly associated with surgical um, infection with an um, odds ratio of 2.87 and increased after controlling for preoperative hemoglobin or controlling for interoperative blood loss. Adjusting for both unmatched variables, the um, odds ratio, ratio was 4.0. Um, so the association between blood transfusion and postoperative infection has been described in the literature, but is still um, discussed controversial and the volume of transfusion was not evaluated before. Important for the discussion is that the restrictive uh, transfusion practice have uh, de decreased morbidity and mortality, for example, in chronic ill patients. 
The findings of the presented study are supporting the restrictive approach. On the other hand, um, there's a study in the year 2019, 300 retrospective reviewed patients with, a, with at least a two liter of intraoperative blood loss showed that postoperative hemoglobin levels of eight gram per deciliter was associated with um, a six time higher risk for surgical side infections compared to those with a level of at least 10. So the authors concluded that a restrictive um, transfusion practice may be not beneficial for patients undergoing spine surgery. And in addition, in 2017 and 2018, Dr. Fiesan, a former fellow of our group, published uh, two papers dealing with transfusion and spine, uh, spine surgery. Reviewing our co own cohort, he noticed a trend for infections and patients who received blood transfusion, which was significant in the subcohort of, the, of smokers. And one year later, he published a systematic review which failed to find a consistent association between um, transfusion and surgical side infections in patients undergoing spinal surgery, um, most likely due to a non-appropriate study design leading to, uh, leading to the need of prospective studies of su uh, sufficient power. So coming to our conclusion, in, con in conclusion, these data support the premise that blood transfusion volume may influence the risk of surgery side infection and is implying that there may be a dose-dependent effect. More prospective studies are required to determine if there is a critical volume of transfusion that shifts the risk-benefit ratio. And of course, the development of surgical side infections following spinal surgery is clearly a multifactorial issue. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lieberman, uh, can you hear me? Can you unmute yourself? Is he? If he can't unmute himself, I'm going to ask Dr. Blumenthal. Um, so there's a conflict here. So first of all, the conflict, number one, is our intensivists and anesthesiologists really try to avoid blood transfusions because they're beholden to this idea that if we do transfusions, the patients will get infected and septic. And that evidence actually comes from the cardiac literature, as Sven alluded to. On the second basis, we all know that the sooner we get patients up and move them, the better they'll do. The case in question that Sven presented had an outstanding result. Her ODI off any pain medications is 12 now, and she started off with 60-something. So two years later, she's great. She's had a fair bit of cell saver volume given, but um, no allergenic blood transfusion. So how do you kind of balance this whole thing out? How can you uh, kind of justify early mobilization paradigms and um, uh, basically know that patients just do better uh, with some blood in their system versus avoidance of transfusions because, oh my God, it might statistically increase the risk of infections? Yeah, if Izzy's easy listening, I would defer to, to his answering that question because um, I think I've given cell safer blood back once in the last two years, so it's not really part of what Izzy, I'm doing right Izzy, now. are you unmuted now? I see you unmuted. Yeah, I, I, I'm here. I, I was unmuted, but the um, there's always a balance. Every case is going to be a balance, and you've got to figure out the risks and benefits of all those those issues that you bring up. Uh, when we first started off, we were all using Cell Saver. Uh, we did an audit of our Cell Saver use here about uh, nine, eight years ago, uh, two years after I'd gotten here. And we were using Cell Saver blood less than 10% of the time, and we weren't even collecting enough because we started much more rigorous anesthesia protocols and started using the TXA, which made a huge difference. So we don't even use cell saver at this point. The only time that we will transfuse uh, intraoperatively if there's an element of hemodynamic instability and postoperatively if there is any kind of symptoms. So we try to avoid it for all the reasons that have been brought up, try to avoid it. But if there is some kind of hemodynamic um, symptoms, if the patients are, are unstable postoperatively, I don't think you've got a choice. You, you've got to transfuse them. Okay. 
And I, I was intrigued by the absence of cell saver use. So um, that's a that's a great subject because um, number one, we do use TXA, but uh, number two, uh, cell saver use does seem to work if you don't store it in the container, but you have kind of one of those continuous uh, reperfusion programs, which basically keeps it going uh, every couple of hundred cc's. Um, I have no evidence uh, to support its use, but uh, it's again one of those many gray zones where we have empirical medicine over uh, evidence-based. Uh, so uh, that's an interesting question. There's obviously a cost to cell saver use, and there's also an introduction of anticoagulants despite, uh, despite the filtration efforts uh, that brings heparin or citrate back into the patient. So that, that's uh, a great surprise and something that we should probably uh, look at on a more systematic basis. Um, so what do you tell patients, Izzy, on major spine surges? I know you do some amazingly uh, beautiful and major spines. Uh, do you tell them that they will anticipate a transfusion or uh, can you usually go transfusion free? We typically are transfusion free. Uh, very few patients end up needing a transfusion. We do explain to them that you may need uh, blood at some point and we'll monitor it and if you've got symptoms we will transfuse you but it's it's far less than 10 percent of the patients right now do you give patients preoperative erythropoietin or something that uh, jacks up their uh, hematocrit no not unless they've got some other underlying hematologic issue we've used it in some um, some patients that may have had a hematologic issue, but uh, we don't do that on a regular routine basis at all. Good. Thanks for your comments, Izzy. Let's go on to obesity. Um, Dr. Rick Price is going to introduce himself and we'll switch the camera setup to him. He's going to talk about the evidence uh, of obesity uh, uh, redaction, if I may say so, uh, prior to elective spine surgery. Thanks, Dr. Chapman. Uh, my name is uh, Rick Price. I'm uh, from WashU in uh, St. Louis and uh, coming from Missouri. I think uh, I'm the resident expert here in obesity and spine surgery. So I've been tasked uh, with talking about obesity. Uh, before uh, presenting my uh, journal article, I have a case that I wanted to show that kind of illustrates the challenges of uh, operating on obese pa patients and some of the complications uh, involved. Uh, this is a 42-year-old male with a BMI greater than 65. Uh, he was a previous uh, professional football player uh, that uh, with also weighed about 450 pounds uh, with a known disc that presented, uh, of course, on a weekend uh, with uh, saddle anesthesia and urinary retention. Uh, this MRI here shows a large L4-5 uh, disc extrusion uh, causing cauda equina. Uh, so on a Sunday, he was taken to the uh, OR uh, and through a lot of struggle, had an L3 to L5 laminectomy. Uh, immediately postoperatively, he, he did well, but then uh, about two weeks after his surgery, he had a ground level fall. And then on July 4th, presented back to the ED with uh, fever, uh, bilateral low extremity uh, pain. And then I was saying that over the last few weeks, he had some wound uh, drainage. Uh, imaging at that time uh, shows a bilateral uh, L5 pars fracture. His MRI on the right side uh, shows evidence of a wound infection. So over the course of about three weeks, he went to the OR three separate times uh, for IND, uh, incision and drainage of the wound uh, and debridement. Uh, and then on the, the third surgery, he had a flap advancement by plastic surgery. Uh, was, the time we, we knew he had bilateral pars fractures, but just given the infection, didn't want to treat it. Uh, however, several days, several weeks later, he came back with right, uh, greater than left, low extremity weakness, and ended up get, getting a, a lumbar fusion to stabilize his spine. Uh, so, overall, this this guy underwent five separate surgeries, um, likely because of how heavy he was in the first place and wasn't able to heal appropriately. Uh, so, the uh, journal article that I've been tasked with presenting is uh, from Sweden. Uh, published in 2013 in the uh, journal Spine. It's, uh, obesity is associated with inferior results after surgery for uh, lumbar spinal stenosis. Uh, this is a rather uh, relatively uh, short paper. Uh, their objective is to determine the association of BMI and outcome of a lumbar spine surgery for spinal stenosis. Um, in Sweden, and I think uh, the United States is very similar, uh, lumbar spinal stenosis is the most common indication uh, for spine surgery. 
And then, uh, as we all know, uh, uh, especially in Western uh, countries, uh, obesity is a uh, epidemic, with 68% of the uh, American population being overweight, and 34% uh, or approximately one third of our population uh, being obese. Uh, and in their uh, uh, paper, they're trying to uh, state that they want to identify preoperative predictors of outcome for lumbar spine surgery. And then uh, this paper was published in 2013. Uh, I think a lot of the literature came out suggesting that uh, obesity is a negative uh, predictor of outcome in recent years. But at the time, uh, 2013, they said there's a lot, a lot of conflicting studies about uh, uh, regarding obesity and uh, spine surgery outcome. So uh, this is a cohort study, uh, and they have a really nice database uh, here on the right side. Uh, they, so they call it SWE Spine. It's the National Swedish uh, Registry for Spine Surgery. Uh, and all patients that undergo spine surgery in, in Sweden is uh, put in this database, uh, and they have uh, a lot of data, diagnosis, and then also outcome measures, uh, ODI, uh, VAS, uh, at, I think six months, one year, two year, five year, and 10 year. <clears throat> but in this uh, study here, they are interested in patients with, at the two year follow up. So it included all patients with lumbar spine surgery from uh, January 2006 to June of 2008 and then use logistic regression uh, to assess the association between BMI and different outcomes. Uh, I don't know how well this, well this is projecting, uh, but this is how, how the, uh, the patient inclusion. They had uh, 5,242 patients were screened. Uh, interestingly, patients less than 50 were not included. Uh, so uh, th this group was all patients greater than 50. Uh, and then also about uh, 40% of the patients, uh, uh, about 2,000 patients, did not have two-year follow-up data. So they were excluded as well for a total of about 2,633 patients that underwent uh, lumbar spine surgery in Sweden at this time. Uh, so going into the results, uh, the first table is uh, characteristics of the, of the group at baseline. Patients, uh, BMI uh, less than 25, there's 819. Uh, about 1,200 patients were uh, classified as being overweight between BMI 25 and 30, and 606 patients were obese with a BMI greater than 30. Uh, interestingly, I'm, uh, what I want to draw your attention to is uh, about 20% of patients in all groups had previous surgery. Uh, and then also at baseline, uh, patients that were obese had significantly significant uh, greater uh, back pain. Uh, lower quality of life and ODI. So before even going in, starting uh, going into surgery, uh, obese patients were doing worse off than patients that were either overweight or uh, normal weight. Uh, second figure, I had this uh, logis logistic uh, regression analysis uh, for overall risk of dissatisfaction of surgery. Uh, the variables uh, weren't very clear. They didn't really. Uh, um, go into detail in the paper, but include a use of analgesics, yes or no, uh, patient satisfaction either being satisfied versus either uncertain or dissatisfied, and the ability to walk. And this was all adjusted for demographics. Uh, they normalized uh, the, the reference to BMI at 25, and you can see that as BMI goes up, uh, you get a, a slight increase in overall dissatisfaction, uh, odds ratio of being dissatisfied. Uh, finally, uh, they showed uh, the, the results for two-year follow-up and uh, looking at uh, quality of life measurements, uh, VAS and ODI, and then all the patients, or in all measures, patients that were obese uh, had statistically significant uh, uh, worse outcomes of, of measurement, uh, either VAS, uh, quality of life, or ODI. Uh, in their discussion, they did say that all three BMI groups had demonstrated significant improvement in back pain and leg pain at two-year follow-up, uh, but they didn't really talk much about that. Um, they were really trying to show that obesity was associated with an increased use of analgesics, more leg and back pain, and inferior quality of life, at least at two years, which I think they may have came short of showing this. Uh, and then there's an association between BMI and dissatisfaction with surgery at two years. And uh, they kind of concluded that to achieve better surgical results, it is important to select patients who will most likely benefit from surgery. Um, I, I did quite a few critiques about this uh, paper. Uh, they didn't include patients less than 50. Uh, and th their reasoning was that sometimes the diagnosis of lumbar stenosis isn't clear in these patients. 
uh, which I don't know how they came to that conclusion. Uh, they also didn't specify what type of uh, lumbar surgery, either it being a fusion or decompression. Uh, and then obese patients at baseline have worse ODIs and VASs. Uh, in all uh, groups, there's significant improvement after lumbar surgery. It's just that you know, these patients are typically even more disabled than patients that are at normal weight. And then for the, the, the big crux of this paper uh, was their uh, logistic uh, regression here, but they didn't really show how they came up with some of the numbers in there. Uh, they, there was no data in the paper and there was no supplementary data. Uh, so I'd actually rename this article that lumbar spine surgery is effective for symptom relief regardless of weight, but obese patients are overall maybe less satisfied after surgery. Thank you. Great presentation, Rick. Thank you for doing this. So, in summary, um, do we actually, how strong is the evidence based for BMI reduction prior to elective spine surgeries, which the case example obviously wasn't? And number two, is there an actual number? The Swedes said 30, and I, I've struggled with a BMI of 30, and I consider myself relatively fit. I ran up to seven flights of stairs here today. Um, so is there a threshold BMI? And uh, uh, that's the latter question. How strong is the actual evidence based for BMI reduction prior to surgery in spine? I think when it comes to complication mitigation, the data is pretty strong. I, and I think, that, as you were saying earlier, BMI 35 seems to be the magic number. Uh, you know, if you can get them, I think the, the less they do, the, or the less they wear, the more weight that they can lose, the better they're going to feel preoperatively. You know, the pain is, they're going to have less pain, I think. But I think the real issue is the complication issues. Like the, the, the guy, the case I presented, you know, had a wound infection that had to be washed out three times and ended up with a, uh, a spinal fusion. Uh, whereas I think that if that patient was probably normal weight, you know, he would have had a, uh, has disc taken out and it would have probably went on with his life. Uh, so I think that it, as far as outcomes, uh, they're talking about patient satisfaction. Uh, and I think that's kind of a soft call on uh, whether to do surgery or not on a, on a patient that's heavier. I think that, that where the money is is the complication reduction in, uh, uh, in patients that are heavier. Outstanding. Thank you. Let's switch to the last speaker. But as we're switching, Jack Ziegler, would you ever even consider doing a lumbar disc replacement in a patient with a BMI above 35? Could somebody sweet talk you into doing a L45 or L5S1 ADR with a BMI of, let's say, 37? Um, you know, yes, yeah, interestingly, the IDE studies went up to BMIs of 40. And we've never really done a sub analysis to see how many were actually in that 35 to 40 group. I suspect it was a small number. But practically speaking, it becomes a matter of um, the, our access surgeon's appetite for delving into a deep abdomen. And most of them have now cut back, at least at L4-5, um, and they've asked us to hold our BMIs to 35. Um, but uh, they will occasionally agree to op, you know, do an L5-S1 exposure on someone who's um, a, a bit bigger, somewhere between 35 and 40. But we do try to limit it, and I think Scott made the point before, or someone did, that it's good to get the patient's buy-in and make them part of the process. So we will often tell people they've got to lose, you know, uh, 20 or 30 or 50 pounds, whatever gets them down to a BMI of 35. Mm -hmm. And if they show up six or nine months later and they've done that, then those patients will usually do well because they've got mm -hmm. skin in the game, uh, literally, literally and figuratively. Um, but uh, the majority of those patients never show up again. So, uh, you know, it's probably a good part of the selection process uh, to tell someone, I know what the problem is, I have a pretty good solution for you, but I cannot do it safely unless you lose X amount of pounds. So the short answer is no, for elective surgery, we try to mitigate the morbidities by limiting our exposure to patients over BMI 35. So I think we have a technical problem with our last uh, lecture. So uh, Elias is standing here, and we're still struggling with the transmission. Um, so the, the uh, additional question now, um, Jack and maybe Scott also, is when we have uh, patients who are larger, um, the, the age-old premise of patients is, and I'm going beyond disc replacements now, uh, doc, just fix my problem. I'll exercise it off. Can we put this theory to rest? Is this uh, just uh, a fake uh, kind of a premise now at this point in time? Scott, you want to address it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it goes back to what Jack was just saying, is the patient's willingness to participate in their care as opposed to that whole concept. And, and I don't like the term fix me um, because it implies a passive role 
from the patient's standpoint. I thought it was interesting in the, in the paper that was just presented that obese patients had less satisfaction from their surgery. I don't know if Andy Block, our clinical psychologist, is on the, on the Zoom, but I would suspect obese patients have worse psychometric profiles, perhaps higher depressive scales uh, on their MMPI, but um, he could better answer that than, than I. So last topic, putting it all together, Dr. Elias Elias, uh, he's going to introduce himself. We're very proud to have him here. It's a great year. And he's going to talk about putting it all together with enhanced recovery after surgery because a lot of the medications that we've traditionally given to patients can make them sick. So are we okay to go? Uh, we are. <coughs> Lee. Lee. Lee, are we okay to can, go? Yeah, but can we put the presentation over no, the screen? No, it's okay. You're good. You have to. Yeah. Lee, can you put the presentation on yeah. the monitor? Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so good morning. My name is Elias Elias. I'm a neurosurgeon. I come from Lebanon. I'm a spine uh, fellow here at Swedish. So, uh, like, so the last paper that I will present today is, uh, is a systematic review about ERAS uh, for spine surgery. It is uh, published uh, in the World Neurosurgery in 2019. So, uh, like EDOS, or, uh, or what we call enhanced recovery after surgery, is mainly EBM uh, or evidence based approach. It is uh, a multidisciplinary team and it has a perioperative counseling between the different teams and the patient. And mainly, it, uh, it assesses the outcomes, such as the uh, length of stay, the complication, the pain scale, and the financial burden of each type of surgery. So uh, ERAS have been implemented in different protocols, such as uh, the colorectal surgery, breast surgery, abdominal surgery, and even in orthopedic surgery. However, it is not, it's still not implemented in spine surgeries. Uh, as you all know that spine surgery is an invasive uh, type of uh, procedures, and it will uh, definitely benefit from e uh, any ERAS protocol integration. <coughs> However, no consensus uh, so far has been implemented, and uh, it, will be, it uh, would be good to uh, like evaluate any traditional ERAS protocol for adaptation to our spine surgeries. So, uh, as I said, this was a systematic review. Uh, the authors, uh, they used the PRISMA, uh, uh, the PRISMA protocol in order to analyze uh, and uh, get their data, and they also used the PICOS model. So they integrated, for the data extraction, they integrated any uh, patient who is more than 18 years of age uh, he had, who had spinal surgery, regardless of the indications, whether it was a traumatic uh, neoplastic or degenerative disease. They included any level, like cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. Uh, they compared it to traditional surgical management or the non-ERAS uh, management. They assessed the complication, financial burden, recovery, blood transfusion, and mainly the type of studies were prospective or retrospective. Uh, so as I said, uh, they used the PRISMA guidelines. They included papers from the 1990 till 2019. My students included uh, among many, mainly spine and ERAS, and uh, their search uh, engine were the PubMed and the Ovid. So uh, regarding uh, the results, this is a flow chart. They started with, a five, uh, with 519 uh, articles, and they ended up with the 19 publications, which were included in their systematic search. So uh, mainly, the population characteristics uh, varied throughout uh, the literature. It varied from minimal invasive surgeries to tumor surgeries. Uh, the MIS, or the minimal invasive view, was uh, the most common uh, entity or type of surgery used among these studies. Uh, three studies used conscious sedation, whereas 16 studies uh, involved general anesthesia. And uh, surgical indication was not specified in 10 studies. So. Uh, uh, the most common occurring indication for, uh, for surgery was uh, spondylosis and degenerative condition. 
and the length of hospital stay was the most reported variable uh, among these papers. So seven studies reported a favorable outcome regarding ERAS-induced uh, or implemented protocol versus three studies reported no difference whether you implement the ERAS or non-ERAS protocol. Pain score was uh, another factor uh, that was affected by implementing the ERAS protocol. Uh, so uh, it was uh, monitored in 13 studies which uh, uh, favored the ERAS protocol. And uh, they mentioned a decrease in uh, use of opioids. However, few studies found no difference between ERAS and non-ERAS. <clears throat> so uh, then the authors uh, discussed a little bit their findings. And they, uh, they mentioned that uh, this is a great opportunity to implement ERAS in spine surgery. Uh, mainly, the most common factors found were the pain control and reduction in, uh, in opioid use. Uh, one of the important factors also of ERAS was the pre-op functional and physical status optimization. So uh, as you can see in this table, they divided the ERAS for spine into three categories, mainly the pre-op, intra-op, and uh, the post-op phases. So regarding the, the pre-op phase, one of the most important factors were the patient education and counseling about his journey throughout the surgery, uh, about, like, for example, smoking cessation, getting physically fit, seeing a PT prior to surgery. The other, uh, other factors are uh, like risk assessment and screening uh, and, and uh, for intervention. Uh, for example, they categorize the patient regarding their age, whether it is above 75 or below 75, the hemoglobin uh, value, the albumin value, and uh, the BMI, of course, whether like BMI is less than 18 or more than, uh, more than uh, 28. Carbs loading was one of the other factors. Uh, and uh, um, uh, was, 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 one among, was uh, one of the factors for the pre-op uh, consideration. So uh, mainly, uh, okay, so those are the last two slides. Mainly, the most, uh, the most common important factor for, e for ERAs were the intra-op technique. It was the minimal invasive one compared to the other traditional ones. Uh, the, type of, uh, gener the type of anesthesia, whether it was TIVA or opioid uh, included uh, anesthesia, and uh, the use of NSAID, and, uh, along with gabapentin and, uh, and uh, Tylenol pre-op versus no use of any of those medications pre-op, early, um, early mobilization and early return to light. So limitation of the study was uh, the paucity of literature regarding uh, uh, ERAS-based uh, study for spine studies. Uh, and as, as I said, for, uh, as a conclusion, they concluded that uh, ERAS in spine surgery, it provides reduction in complication. Most relevant observation was the use of MIS. And uh, variation in spine surgery can, uh, like, should trigger the use of multiple ERAS protocol depending on the indication and intervention. Thank you. Thank you finished on time. Um, thank you, Elias. Um, Izzy, can you conclude this session uh, by kind of giving us some overarching principles? So uh, briefly, um, Mike Jansen showed us how uh, you can do real ERAS with ambulatory surgery centers, but that's an idealized situation. Um, you have uh, done visionary things by developing a co-management um, uh, principle with your hospitals. So. How do we put it all together? How can we get expensive substances like uh, lysozymal bound, uh, uh, liposome bound anesthetics and IV Tylenol into patients to try to maximize their outcomes? Thanks. Thanks, Jens. Uh, great session, great topics, uh, interesting discussions. W one point I'd like to make is that a zebra can't change its stripes. You're going to have obese patients, you're going to have smokers, you're going to have diabetics. They'll say they're going to do it, but the reality is they don't. Uh, they, they always come back and, yeah, you fix their back and they say, oh, I'll exercise. Nah, they don't. And if you look at the trends in bariatric surgery right now, those trends are falling off because we've seen that these patients still have the same underlying problems. So I don't think you can you can rely on 
what's going on. You have to treat that patient and decide whether this is a candidate for surgery or not. With respect to all the other items you brought up, it's a team approach. You have to justify what you're doing and you have to make sure the hospital administration understands the balance between risk, benefit, complications, and optimizing the outcome. And if you want to use the various liposomal bound uh, local anesthetics postoperatively, which are expensive, you've got to justify it and show them that, that patients do do better in the short term with it. Uh, likewise, with a lot of the prehab programs, getting them on nutrition, getting them in an exercise program as much as you can, someone's got to pay for it and push for it, and the insurance companies are really uh, not very supportive of what we do. So let's just keep treating patients the best way we can, analyze the risks and benefits, and everybody just have a great weekend and stay safe out there. Thanks, Jens. Thank you. Great all. job, Swedish. <laughs> Take care, guys. Thank, thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.